the choir today. Appreciate that. Um, that was not just an extra congregational, because we're going to call it choir. Amen? Okay. So that's official. That's official. By the way, let me just throw this at you. Um, before we get into this, I'm going to make a quick announcement. We have uh, the first Sunday in April, what we call a Hilltop Baptist Church job fair. Now, let me explain what that means. That means a lot of you folks that are sitting here might be able to be a far more active than what you are. Uh, we have a lot of opportunities in our church. We have children's ministries. We have security, safety teams. We have sound. We have video uh, that needs help. We have nursery. We have choir. We could just go on and on with all of the opportunities that we have for you to be able to minister in the church. And so what we want to do is we want to try to enlist you in some of those things. And so we have a sign-up sheet out in the back. And what we'd like for you to do is sign up to be a part of that. And, and it doesn't obligate you to anything. What it does is it says, I'm going to show up. I'm going to listen to some of the things that we have to offer, some of the opportunities that we have. And we're going to feed you. All right. We're going to take care of you. And, and you can just come and say, you know, that might be something I'd be interested in. And there might be ministries that we have that you don't even know that we have. And it'd be good opportunities for you to become a part of that. So let me encourage you to sign up for that, to be a part of that. You might be sitting there thinking, I don't know. I don't know if this is anything I can do. Well, come and find out. You might find out there's plenty for you to do. Um, you might say, well, you know, I can't do this or I can't do that. Or, but that's okay. A lot of those things are things that people uh, can teach, will teach people that... Uh, can, can do other things, can do other things. But we have lots of opportunities uh, for you to serve. And so let me tell you, there's something for you to do, I promise. There is something that you can do to be a part of the uh, workings of the church. So I would encourage you to sign up for that. Come out and just hear what we got to share with you and see what's available to you. All right, so Cody, you won't have to make that announcement at the end. I've already made it. All right, so there you have it. We'd love to have you come out and be a part of that. Um, as you know, we, our theme for the year has to do with proclaiming God's Word. And I kind of have a subtopic that we've been going on for here the last couple of Sundays, and that is that God's Word is the foundation of every structure. It's the foundation of our very lives. It's the foundation of our homes. It's the foundation even of our government, our community, our nation, whatever. It is the foundation of the church. What we find is that the Word of God, if it is not the foundation for who we are and what we are, then that foundation that we have is going to crumble. It's the only foundation that is sure, the only foundation that is going to stand the test. In Matthew chapter 7, we've already dealt with these verses. We've already walked through them, so we know what they mean, but I want to share them with you today because they are the backbone of what we're talking about. It says, Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended, the floods came, the winds blew, beat upon the house, and it fell not. For it was founded upon a rock. Every one that heareth these sayings of mine, and doeth them not, shall be likened unto a foolish man, uh, who built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon the house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. So whether we're dealing with our own lives, or whether we're dealing with family, whether we're dealing with government, whether we're dealing with church, keep in mind that if we are not built upon that foundation of the rock, which is Jesus Christ, which is His Word, then we are built upon sand, and when the troubles and times of trials come, that foundation washes away and our house crumbles, because we have no foundation by which we might stand on. Today, we want to deal with what I think is an incredibly touchy and sensitive topic for a lot of people. And that is dealing with God's Word in regard to government. Now, what makes this such a touchy and sensitive topic is that not everyone within the nation is a believer. So not everyone within the nation is going to believe and stand where we believe, or what we believe and where we stand. And they do not want to be governed by biblical principles, God's Word, God's laws. I've always heard it say, said that one should never talk about religion and politics. Yet today, we're going to talk about both. 
Today we're going to merge both and we're going to get real political, I guess, in a lot of respects. But now, I, just so you know, I'm not here today to endorse candidates. I'm not here today to promote a political party. Uh, so you're not going to hear any of that. But I will be sharing what pleases God within a nation, any nation, and how God judges a nation and the fact that God will one day rule the nations. And that's what we're going to be dealing with. So every nation, as we examine this, every nation has a responsibility of being founded upon God's Word. Understand that the point of our message today is not to merely establish what God says about nations, but that we realize that we're to be based upon the commitment to God's Word, our trust in the truth of His Word, that we are not of this world, you and I, but we are citizens of heaven. But in respect to that, we are ambassadors for Christ, and we are part of God's kingdom. And that being the case, we need to be at peace with this government, and we ought to obey the laws of this government. But ultimately, our obedience is under the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and Him alone. Now, I say that for this reason. When we think about it, if you visit another land, let's say you decide you're going to take a trip, you're going to visit, I don't know, Europe, Europe and you're going to go through all the different nations of Europe, and you're going to visit them, Keep in mind that while you are visiting there, you are not a citizen of their government. You don't have to agree with their government. You are a citizen of the United States of America, and you go understanding that when it comes right down to it, you're going to abide by the laws of the nation whereby you are a citizen. However, while you're visiting those European nations, you understand that they too have laws, and they have a government, and you're going to do your best to abide in that because you want a peaceful vacation. You want to be able to go over there and be at peace, see all the sights, do all the things you need to do, because you understand and know that that's their government, and you're going to go over there and abide by their rules, by their laws, and you get it. You may not agree with them. You don't have to agree with them. You're not a citizen of their nation. However, if you want to be at peace with them while you're on vacation, you're going to abide by their laws. Otherwise, you wind up in trouble. Amen. Keep in mind that we, as children of God, those who know Jesus Christ, we are ambassadors of heaven itself. We are a citizen of the very kingdom of God, and we are merely in this world. We are merely in this nation, in this state, in this city, because we understand and know that God has given us a, a, a standard by which we need to apply, and we have a job that needs to be done. But by and large, we're not governed by the rules of this land. We are governed by God Himself. But even in God's laws, He tells us, listen, be at peace with the government. Be at peace with the laws and the rules of the land in which you dwell. So we understand that and we get it. All right, so that's where we are and, uh, and we look at that. All right, so throughout the Bible we find examples of God's people who actually hold uh, very high positions, positions of authority, even in pagan nations. If you look throughout the scripture, you'll find Joseph served under the Pharaoh of Egypt. He was second in command of all of Egypt, yet he was a man of God. And he was able to do both because he understood that his first priority was what God would have him to do. And by understanding that, he was able to abide by the laws of the land and still serve his God. Not only that, but Daniel, who served under Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon, he also served under Darius uh, the Mede, and in so doing... We realize that he abode by the laws of the land, did everything he was supposed to do until they interfered with the things that he was committed to do for God. And when they interfered with that which he was committed to do unto God, he continued his work for God and suffered the penalties of the laws of the land, God protecting him. We know the story, but not get into all of that. Esther was married to Ahasuerus, who was the king of Persia. She understood but she still abode by the things that God had established in her life and did great things. We find that Nehemiah served Artaxerxes, who was also king of Persia, and he understood the authority that Artaxerxes had over him. He made sure that everything that he did, he did under the authority of Artaxerxes, but he also understood his commitment to God and did that which God had called him to do. I said all of that to simply say that, listen, we have a responsibility 
to be at peace with our government. And we can serve and we can live in a, go a government, even one that is pagan. We could even serve in a government that stands opposed to everything that God stands for. And as long as we are first committed unto God, we can still do so. And we can still abide in that. The foundation of each of these people was not found in allegiance to their government. The foundation of each of their lives was founded in what they believed about the Word of God. And they stood fast, and they stood firm. One last thought before we really get into the message is remember, just as we learned last week, that God instituted marriage in the family, God also instituted nations. God also established nations. And we'll see that today as we go on. And if nations fail to rest on God's Word as their foundation, they too have a foundation that's built on sand, and they too will fall. Ultimately, every nation, every nation that denies God will fall and will fail because it's built upon sand. And I'll show you those here in a moment. Now, this is the only thing I'll say in regard to one's devotion to political parties, devotion to political leader, leaders, or any concept that some better government will somehow fix all of our problems. Understand this. Our hope is not founded in a political forum. Our hope is not founded in any national prosperity. It is not founded upon whether or not our nation is economically sound, militarily sound, whether or not it's even morally secure. All of this will one day crumble regardless. The only hope we have is in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The only foundation that you and I have that is sure is the Word of God. And we need to understand that, listen, when we trust Jesus Christ, Him crucified, conquered death, hell, and the grave, arisen again, that we might have eternal life, unless we trust that, we do not have a foundation that is absolutely sure. And the foundation will crumble just as if our nation was resting upon sand. Keep in mind that one day Jesus Christ will rule all nations. He'll be the King of kings, Lord of lords, and He'll establish the rules and the laws of the entire world. And that's just a fact. Because I believe the very Word of God, and the very Word of God is where we, what we are built upon. Now with all that having been said, know this. God established nations. He established government. God has established all of these. Romans chapter 13, if you want to turn there. Romans chapter 13 gives us a pretty good picture of this. And we're able to see that the nations are even built upon God. When our nation turns its back on God, and keep in mind that even within, the within our own nation, within the United States of America, there are still some principles that are still left, principles that are still established, that are established based upon God's Word. And those principles are still established and still stand. And many Many of them still stand. In fact, most, much of our laws are established upon the very principles that God gave Moses when he came off of, uh, of the mountain. And so what we find is the government itself is built upon these principles that have been established. And until those principles have been dissolved and completely taken away, our nation will stand as though it was standing on a rock. But at that moment, will we choose to ignore all of those principles? which we're on the verge of doing. At that very moment where we push aside whether or not they, they exist for a reason, whether or not they're important to us, whether or not we have other principles that override those principles, understand that God has established that and we need to stand on it. Romans 13, 1, let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. There's no power but of God. Let me say that again. There is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Stop there for a second. It doesn't matter what the power is. It doesn't matter what the strength is. It doesn't matter who they are, what they believe, what they teach. It doesn't matter if they're pagan. It doesn't matter if they're Christian. The powers that be have been ordained of God. That's what he tells us. So it's pretty clear. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power resisteth the ordinance of God. They that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Wilt thou not uh, then not be afraid of the power? 
Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same, for he is a minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in vain, for he is a minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Let me stop for a second. When we look at this picture, understand when Paul is writing this. Paul is writing this to the churches of Rome, and he does so at a time where the leadership of that nation, where the Roman leader was as corrupt as corrupt can possibly get. Where the Roman leader not only hated Jews, but they hated Christians. They hated both. And they would do anything and everything to destroy both. They wanted neither of them to prosper. And so he's writing this at a time where he lived uh, in a government that hated everything about who he was and what he was. And he said, we need to obey them. And he said, we need to honor them. And he said, they were established and ordained of God. Now, that having been said, wherefore, you must needs be subject, not only for wrath, but also for conscience sake, because God said so. Yeah. Amen. For, for this cause, pay you tribute also, pay your taxes, for they are God's ministers attending continually upon this very thing. Render, therefore, to all their dues, tributes to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom, Fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. God ultimately gives the nation its power. Romans 13, 1 tells us that. For there is no power but of God, the powers that be are ordained of God. So as much as nations, leaders, despots, kings, pharaohs, Caesars, presidents, congress, parliaments, queens, rulers, I don't care who you name, if they're in a position of leadership, they are there because God gave them that power. Amen. That position that they hold is a position ordained of God. Now let me preface that. That doesn't mean that those who are wicked and evil, that God says it's okay for them to be wicked and evil. That's not what God says. He has ordained the position. He has given them that leadership role. He has given the nation the place in which the nation holds so that these leaders might be able to be used in whatever way God chooses. And by the way, even the wicked rulers can be used of God. You say, well, how can that be? Well, it's easy. When you look back in the Old Testament, you see very often where wicked rulers were used of God. He used wicked rulers to judge Israel. Uh, he used wicked rulers in a lot of different ways. Give you an example. Romans 9, 17 talks about Pharaoh. And he says this, For the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, Even for this same purpose have I raised thee up, that I might, listen to why, that I might show my power in thee, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. God raised up Pharaoh for the purpose of showing his power. Now I want you to stop and think about that. His Pharaoh, he was a king of Egypt, essentially, ruled the world at the time, and Egypt was a mighty power. And God used Pharaoh to grow up and to become this great and mighty power, but then God raised up Moses and used Moses to conquer Pharaoh. Well, how did he do that? He led the nation of Israel out of Egypt because they were in bondage there. You remember when they crossed over the Red Sea after all the plagues and all the things that you've read about and, and know about? They cross over the Red Sea on dry ground. They get on the other side. They get to turn back and watch Pharaoh and all of his armies be swallowed up in the rivers. He raised up Pharaoh for that moment. All of Pharaoh's life, all of Pharaoh's childhood, all of that of him being ordained to be the, the next in line, for him to become the, the ruler of the world, all of that was for one single purpose and for one single moment. And that single moment was so that the nation Israel could watch them get swallowed up in the Red Sea to see God's mighty hand overpower this great and mighty man. And he'd done so, not just for the purpose of Israel to see, but so that it might be written in his book, so that you and I might be sitting at the Hilltop Baptist Church on March the 17th, 19, or 2024, and we sit here and tell the story again, and remember that as mighty as Pharaoh was, God is mightier. Amen. He said, I raised you up for this moment, so that the world can see and know that I am who I say I am. Man, I love this picture. 
when Moses came to God and said, when the people of Israel, when they want to know who I represent, when they want to know the God that I serve, what do I tell them? He says, tell them that I am the I am. God wants us to know even today that he is the I am. I am the I am. And we understand and know that God is above all else. Man, there is no king, there is no power, there is no might that can overpower God. I really believe that nations today, and we look at our nations and by and large, the nations of the earth have rebelled against God. By and large, by and large most every nation has rebelled against God. We see our own nation who has been the last bastion as, of, of those who defend much of what God's word is. We see ourselves falling by the wayside. We see the very last of nations falling and, 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 and going away from all the very standards and such that God has given. Abandoning his book, abandoning his word, yeah. abandoning our trust we've had in him. And as we see our nation fall, what we might be seeing is the last nation that has any glimmer of hope in serving God to fall by the wayside. And we look at that and we think, man, so has the nations overpowered God? Oh no, oh no. Every nation has been raised to a place of power because there's going to come a day and there's going to come a time when God's going to use those nations who have turned against Him when God's going to use all the nations of the world that have rebelled against him, and he's going to rise up, and he's going to become the king of kings and the lord of lords. That is it. He'll take every nation and conquer them. He'll judge every nation. He'll stand opposed to every nation. And there'll not be a nation that'll be able to stand against God. There'll not be a leader that can stand against God. And so when we look at this picture, it could very well be that when we look at all those great nations that have, that have risen up, Understand and know it's for a point in time where God returns in the person of Jesus Christ and conquers them ever one and rules and reigns over each and every one of them. You know, I think about that. You know, we think about great leaders over time and we see them come and we see them go. They rise up and they fall. We see some that in Scripture tells us they'll be around for a long time. We see the Persian Empire, and even today, Iran has been a problem. We see Babylon rise up, and we see the great power it was, and even today, Iraq has been a problem. We look at these, we see the Battle of Gog and Magog, and, and we understand that it's a conglomerate of a group of, of, of nations that are somewhere uh, kind of north or north northeast of Jerusalem. It looks like they fall within that realm of Russia. Could it be Russia? I don't know, but what we see is Russia is a great and mighty power even today. And we see this, this Gog and Magog, Magog specifically, we see that as a time that will take place even as far as the end of the thousand year millennial reign. But ultimately, God overpowers each and every one of them. They are nations that rise up. You know, God's desire, whether we realize it or not, is that every nation follow Him. I realize we've got nations that reject Him. I understand that the bulk of the nations turn against Him. But His desire is not that. In Acts 17, 26, He tells us, And hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on the face of the earth. By the way, you know, here's a lot of problem we have in our world, nation against nation, race against race, and, and people backbiting and, and, and eating each other up and, and destroying one another because of, of various reasons, you know, whether it be culture, whether it be color, whether it be language, whatever it might be. God says he raised up one blood, one blood. All nations were made out of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth and hath determined the times before appointed the bounds of their habitation. God decided how large that nation was going to be. God has built their habitation. God has established every rule, every reign. Yes. But look at verse 27. Listen to what he says. Talking about the nations. That they should seek the Lord. If happily they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. 
in talking about our, I, I, our grew up nations, I, I rose up nations, I, I caused nations to come into existence all out of one blood. And the purpose in raising these nations up is that they might seek after the Lord, but the nations have rejected Him, the nations have turned on Him, and the nations want nothing to do with Him. Even nations who reject Christ have an obligation, have an obligation to be subject under their rule. If I lived in Russia, I'd have an obligation to be subject under their rule. If I lived in a third world country that, that practiced Muslim, that were Muslim or Islamic, I, I have an obligation to abide by the government. I never forsake God. I never, I never abandon His word. But I have an obligation to be loyal to my nation. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God. And they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. Man, that's a tough battle. That's a tough verse to battle with, isn't it? I mean, i got to tell you, that's a hard one. Because there are times when even in our own nation, I look and I think, man, I hate this. I hate what we're doing. By the way, I don't have time for this, but I'm just going to throw it out there just for a moment. I don't have time to give you the references. I'm going to trust that you know that I know they're there. You don't need to speak evil about your government, about the people of your government, about the leadership of your government. God knows who they are. God knows who they are. And I'm here to tell you, He tells us not to do that. I might not like where we are politically. I might not like the laws that are being made. I might not like the people that are in office. But I'm here to tell you, it is not my job to ridicule them, to beat up on them. You don't see Jesus doing it. You don't see Paul doing it. You don't see those guys doing that. I don't need to be cracking on them. I need, I need to trust God. Say, God, you have a purpose in my life, in my life. And while I am in a government that I have to abide by the rules and the laws and I ought to do so because it pleases you and because it, it, it soothes my conscience because it's the right thing to do. But God, ultimately, my job is to focus on you and what you would have me to do. So even within a ruthless, terrible, godless nation, it's important to realize that we have to have some sort of rules and justice. God's not the author of confusion. So even some sort of rules are good rules. I watched a thing one time. It's been a long time ago. And it was an interview. It was a really long time ago. I can't even remember when it was. But, but they were interviewing this guy. And they had his face all blurred. You know how they do when they don't want you to see who they are. And he was a gang member. And he was a part of this huge gang. And, uh, and they were interviewing him. And I remember this particular question because they said, you know, about this being a gang. You know, what is it about being a part of this gang that made you want to do this? I loved his answer. I really did. He was wrong, and I get all of that, and he ought not be a part of it, but I understood where he was coming from. He said, I grew up in, in a society and in a place where there were no rules. He said, it was just death and dying. He said, I grew up in a community where there was no laws. The police wouldn't come there. Nobody would tend to it. It was a terrible place to live. And he said, I realized that that, that was not the way it's supposed to be. There has to be some sort of rules, good, bad, indifferent. I realized there had to be something that at least governed us, even if it was something bad. But there had to be something. And he realized that even a ruthless rule of order with that gang was better than no rules whatsoever. And he said, at least I knew where I stood. He said, I, I don't have to agree with it, but at least I knew where I stood. And if I was going to be at peace anywhere, yeah, yeah. if I were going to have at least somebody watching my back, yeah. if I had any form of safety or comfort, I knew that the only hope I had was within this particular gang. I thought, I get that. I don't agree with him, but I get it. I get how you can be so hopeless and so hopelessly lost that you're looking for something and it's all you can find and at least there's something that has structure. The sad thing is many of our nations have come to this place. This was not U.S., by the way. Many of our nations have come to a place where the structure's gone. It's confusion. And there's no peace. Nowhere where you can find a place where you think, you know, all is well. And people are looking for some kind of structure. Amen. I learned this a long time ago as well. But 
you know, we, we sometimes get really concerned about folks that are addicted to this or addicted to that. And, and we think, why would anybody ever do such a thing? Well, we're, we're measuring that basically on our life. They do it because they don't know anything else. It's the only structure they know. They're, they're, they're looking for something. Folks, the problem is, is we have what they're looking for, and we're not sharing it with them. We have what they're looking for, and we're not as aggressive to share it as they are. Uh, let me share this with you. Let me just say this. If we were as aggressive with the gospel of Jesus Christ as a drug dealer is in selling his goods, I wonder how many people we'd see come to know Jesus Christ. Just a thought. We have an obligation to follow the laws of the land. We have an obligation to obey it until it conflicts with the commands of God. And we have an obligation to even pray for our leadership. He tells us in Romans 13, he says, Wherefore we must needs be subject not only for wrath, but also for conscience sake. For for this cause pay you tribute. Um, for they are God's ministers, tending continually under this very thing. Render therefore it all their dues. Tribute to them tribute is due. Custom to whom custom fear, to whom fear honor, to whom honor. Isn't that hard to do? You know, but Jesus even said this. When the Pharisees came to him and tried to put him on the spot about paying taxes or tithing, and he tells them, he says, Render therefore unto Caesar the things which are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God's. So there's no conflict in this. Give to Caesar what belongs to him. Give to God what belongs to him. There you go. We're all satisfied. We're all happy. You know, the conflict comes when the laws of the land forbid me from serving God. And then I am forced and compelled to serve God. Like Daniel. Like Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. Like those guys who had to take a stand because they understood and knew what God would have them to do and they were not going to be swayed. Sometimes that has to happen. They did not allow their commitment to their government conflict with their devotion to God. Amen. We can never do that. I'm committed to my government. I believe I, I uh, ought to be a good citizen of this nation. I really do. I believe I ought to serve. I ought to do all the things I need to do. But at the same time, when it conflicts with who I am in Christ, then my stand has to be with those things of Christ. When the world tells me that I cannot do what God said to do, I have to do what God said to do. You know, in Psalm 75, 7, we know this also. God judges nations. But God is the judge. He put it down one and set it up another. God establishes nations. He tears down nations. You know, we find in the book of Daniel a list of some of that. You remember the statue that he gives us a picture of, the dream of Nebuchadnezzar, and then he has his own dream about the same thing, basically, gives us a little more details. And basically, this is what the statue was. He spoke of the Babylonian Empire, who was to rule during the time that the prophecy was actually being made. And when we're talking about the city of Babylon, I mean the, the, the kingdom of Babylon, he tells them this. He says, listen, it's going to be a great, great kingdom. He tells Nebuchadnezzar, it's led by you. When you're gone, the kingdom will, will fall apart. So he lets them know in prophecy, this kingdom is going to rule until God tears it down. Amen. And then the next one, he says, is going to rise up like this. He said the next kingdom that rises up is going to be two kingdoms that merge as one, the Medes and the Persians. They're going to join together and they're going to come against uh, Babylon and they're going to overpower Babylon. You guys remember the story in the Bible about the writing on the wall? That was the time when the Medes and Persians came and conquered Babylon. And so what we find is in that picture, God says, this is coming. I'm going to raise up another nation and going to conquer your nation and tear it down. God raises them up and tears them down. The Mede Persians became a powerhouse. And I mean, they were a powerhouse for a long, long time. And then God raised up Alexander the Great and the Grecian Empire. And he told them this in the prophecy. I'm going to raise up this, this empire. And talks about Alexander the Great. Then he talks about when Alexander the Great dies, he's going to divide it into four kingdoms, his generals and all of that. He tells them the whole picture, the whole story. You know why? Because God raises up the nation and its power. Amen. But when it came time to destroy the nation, he rose up a powerhouse in Rome. And rose Rome up to conquer the Grecian Empire. And he used Rome to conquer them. And, and so he raised up this other power. Yeah. 
Now Rome, he never ever tore Rome down. Rome just kind of imploded, just kind of fell apart all on its own. But he does prophesy that Rome will rise back up in, in a ten nation confederacy. But here's the interesting thing about that. He says it's going to rise up in a ten nation confederacy and one guy is going to step up and rule it all who is the Antichrist. And the Antichrist will become a great power for three and a half years. But you know what happens then? For another three and a half years, God just really wreaks havoc on the nation. So a total of seven years and then God says, and that power I will tear down. He raises them up and he tears them down. And I think it's important that we understand that, listen, God can raise up the nations and he can also tear them down. And it's God who will one day then completely and totally judge each and every one of those nations. What we find is in Revelation 19, 15, out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword. Now listen to what he says. That with it he should smite the nations. You know what that sharp sword is? What we've been preaching about? God's Word. He's going to take the very foundation that nations should have built themselves upon, the very foundation that they should have established in their nation, and He's going to use that to crush them, to destroy them, to beat them, to tear them down. He raises them up and he tears them down. It is God who will judge the nations. So nations, even today, that think they've got an upper hand, he says, he shall rule them with a rod of iron. He treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. Notice how he smites them, and out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword. Don't forget to listen, every nation that opposes God, God's going to judge them. We can look at our own nation, understand this, that even though that they might think they have the upper hand, they might think they can throw God out of the picture, let's get Him out of the school, let's get Him out of the government, let's get Him out of everything we can get Him out of. The throwing away the very one that's going to judge them. I want you to imagine this for a moment. You're going to go to court, and you're going to stand before the judge. I don't care what court. You're going to stand before the judge. And before you ever make it to court, you decide you're going to oppose every law that's out there. The laws that he is appointed to judge. And you're going to oppose every one of them. And you're going to take it a step farther. You're going to kill his son. Knowing that you're going to stand before him. You're going to deny his word. He comes before you. He says, if you'll do this, I'll spare you. And you spit in his face. You mock him. And you say, I will not acknowledge your word. In fact, I will not allow your word to be repeated in my home. And then comes the day of judgment. You appear in the court. You're sitting there. And you think, well, I better look good for this. You put on your finest suit. You find, you find the finest lawyer that you could find. And you come and stand before the judge. And the judge looks at you and says, I know you. I know you. I know what you've done. I know you've rejected me. I know you've rejected my words. I know what you've done. That's what happens to nations. Nations will stand before him after having rejected everything that he established. Nations that he built Nations that he established, nations that he rose up, nations that he would have blessed. But instead, there are nations that fall before him. And by the way, if you think that the United States is never going to fall, if you think putting in a new president, if you think putting in a new Congress, if you think reestablishing all the new Senate and, and House and all of those things, if you think that's going to change anything, when I look ahead and I read the end of the book, you know what I find? That every nation comes against God. Comes against His nation, Israel. Every nation, not just one or two. It doesn't say I'm going, there's a few that doesn't. Every nation. And every nation will be judged. So if you get the idea that we're going to fix it, oh, it might be for just a little while. It might just delay the judgment for a moment. But here's the end. The end is every nation will be judged by this very word. 
Now notice this, and I'm going to close with this. God will one day rule over every nation. Every nation. He tells us in Revelation 22 too. He tells us that nations are going to be healed. There'll be a time where God's going to say, okay, we're going to heal the nations. Let me tell you real quick, and I don't have time to back this up. You'll just have to do your own research. But here's what happens. Just right after the tribulation period, he'll enter into a time of a thousand years. And he tells us that you and I, by the way, are going to be kings and priests. I wonder when that time's going to come. It could be during that time of the thousand years. It could be in eternity. I don't know which. But if it's during the time of the thousand year reign where Jesus Christ rules and, Israel, and rules with Israel, what we find is the kings and priests of those nations that are there might be you and I. Might be you and I. It might be a situation where you and I are ruling that nation. So what he does is he heals the nation by putting someone there as a leader that will abide by his rule and that every nation will honor him. Every nation will worship him. Every nation will look to him. The end of that thousand years, Satan's released for what the Bible calls a short season. And many of those nations, the people of those nations may say, now we've had enough of this and side with Satan. Another story. But my point being is he's going to heal the nations and the nations will fall under his rule and will abide in his will. You imagine today, if all the world, just imagine this for a moment, if all the world, let's say every nation came together and decided, we got to abide by this book. We need to stand on this. I mean, we came together and our, our world motto was B-I-B-L-E, yes, that's the book for me. Can you imagine if the world would come together. You and I would have a smile ear to ear. We'd think, man, all is well. That's not going to happen until Jesus Christ comes and he rules and he reigns. Now understand, that's where we are. He says this in Revelation 22, 2, in the midst of the street of it and on either side of the river was there a tree of life which bare twelve manners of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month. You think, well, why did he do that? And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. For the healing of the nations. Because he wants nations to come together. God will heal the nations, and he will then rule over them, and every nation will honor him. Know this. Regardless of where the nations are today, it doesn't really matter doesn't really matter. One day, God will rule. And God will reign. My message to you is this. Don't get tangled up with the world, politics, government. Don't get so tangled up that you lose sight of the fact that God desires for you to trust Him and that your only hope lies within Him. He sent His only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross so that you might have eternal life. Understand and know. Don't get tangled up with all this other mess. Don't let it dictate your life. Don't let it govern your life. Don't let it put you in a place of despair. In the end, I've read the book, God wins. Amen. And in the end, this book is the solid foundation upon a rock. And we are to be built upon this foundation and this foundation alone. In the end, all of those who have built them, their houses on anything other than this book, they'll crumble as the sand washes out from beneath them. Know the truth and trust Him as your Lord and Savior. Today, bow your heads. You know, today, I realized I preached about nations, but nations are made up of you and I. And we need to understand, nations are made up of you and me. And, and understand that each and every one of us need to realize that our foundation is upon God's Word. It's not about whether or not my nation stands where it ought to stand or not. I wish it would. I want it to. I'll, every time I have the opportunity to vote, I'll vote accordingly. But I'm here to tell you that no matter what happens, don't despair. God always stands true. When trials and troubles come, make sure that your foundation is the Word of God, that you stand sure upon it and it alone. Dear Father, I pray that today each and every one of us might examine our lives, our hearts, and make sure 
Lord God, where our hopes and dreams lie. Lord, where we, what we're looking to, to find the peace and to find all that you would have us to have. Lord God, I hope and I pray that we'll stand fast upon your word. I pray that every person here is standing upon your word. If the nation crumbles, if it falls, if tyranny prevails, Lord God, I pray that we'll still stand upon your word. If we're huddled up in the basement together, I pray that we'll huddle up upon your word. If we're hiding in a cave together, I pray that we're hiding on your word. I pray, Father, that whatever comes, that we'll stand fast upon your very word. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let's stand.